In today's interconnected world, the ability to track and monitor assets in people in real time has become increasingly important. That's where real-time location systems come into play. Hi, Mohamed Afani here from Novelbits, and on this channel, I help developers and engineers learn about Bluetooth Low Energy and how to develop for this technology. Real-time location systems, or RTLS, can be used to identify and track the location of objects in real time. It uses a combination of wireless communication, sensor networks, and data processing to approximate the location and sometimes the direction of an object. Asset tracking allows for real-time monitoring and management of movable assets in many different kinds of environments. Think about scenarios like nurses locating medical equipment in hospitals, keeping track of the location of high-value manufacturing assets throughout the supply chain, or locating specific pallets within a warehouse. In the asset tracking scenario, you have three distinct components. The first is what are generally referred to as tags or transmitters. These are typically moving beacons that are attached to the assets being tracked. The second component of the system is what are called readers, locators, or simply receivers. These are stationary anchors that relay information about the moving beacons via Ethernet, Wi-Fi, or cellular up to a central server. And the third component is some sort of backend server. As the central backend system receives information from the receivers, it uses it to approximate the location of the moving beacons. It can then project those locations on a map showing the tracked assets. A similar type of system to RTLS, but not to be confused with it, is an indoor navigation or positioning system, referred to as IPS. This type of system enables users to find their way inside buildings or facilities where GPS signals are weak or non-existent. In this scenario, the transmitters are stationary beacons that are deployed in specific positions within a facility where an indoor navigation system is being set up. So for example, if you were implementing an airport navigation system to help people find their gate or other places of interest, you'd have stationary beacons placed throughout the airport. In this scenario, the receivers are typically mobile phones, but they could also be specialized devices designed to accept the information from the stationary beacons. The key thing to understand here is that the receivers move with the person who wants to utilize the navigation system. The receivers will relay the information to the backend server via Wi-Fi or cellular. And in this scenario, similar to RTLS, the server will do the actual location calculations based on the information it receives from the receivers. BLE is increasingly being used for RTLS due to its wide availability, low cost, and long battery life. It also has a longer range than some alternatives such as RFID. So far, we've been talking about RTLS in a general sense to give you a framework for understanding what they are used for and how they are typically configured. But RTLS is just that. It is a general term used to describe many different types of location tracking systems. Depending on the specific application, requirements, and project constraints, one or more techniques will be used to actually do the location approximation and direction finding within an RTLS. The two techniques that we will look at in this video are RSSI and direction finding. We'll start with RSSI because it is by far the most commonly used methodology and will work for a majority of RTLS applications. So first of all, what is RSSI? RSSI stands for Received Signal Strength Indicator and it measures the strength of a received radio signal in a wireless communication system. In the context of RTLS, RSSI-based location estimation is based on the strength of the signal sent from the transmitter or transmitters to the receiver or receivers. In reality, this works differently depending on the specific use case. For simple proximity applications, just one receiver could be used. In an asset tracking scenario where proximity information isn't sufficient and you need to estimate the actual location of an asset, you would need to use three or more receivers or locators and rely on the trilateration and the path loss model to estimate the transmitter's location relative to the receivers. Similarly, in an indoor navigation scenario, three or more beacons would be needed to accurately locate the receivers, which in this case would be smartphones or other BLE devices used for navigation. Recall how asset tracking systems are set up with a transmitter attached to an asset. But imagine that instead of having just one stationary receiver in a warehouse, you have 10. In this case, all of the receivers would pass the signal strength information onto the server, and the server would generally then use a trilateration algorithm to approximate the location of the asset. 
As I mentioned, RSSI is very commonly used in RTLS systems, mainly because of the simplicity and cost effectiveness. The simplicity does come with a cost. RSSI can be inaccurate. It is very susceptible to noise and obstacles in the environment, particularly the line of sight of the signal. We'll get into more detail about this shortly. On the positive side, the simplicity of RSSI means that there are minimal hardware requirements. In fact, a simple RSSI system could be set up with just a single locator for monitoring one or more beacons with some limitations. When we get into direction finding, you'll see why this can be a major advantage for RSSI. RSSI systems also have the advantage of being compatible with smartphones, which can be used as readers in the RTLS. RSSI does have limitations though. The first is that it only provides approximate location information. It will not be able to provide information about what direction a device is located relative to the locator. That's where direction finding comes in, which we'll get into shortly. The other main limitation is the lack of accuracy. Because RSSI is based on signal strength, anything in the environment that could affect the signal strength will reduce the accuracy of the distance and hence location calculation. A few notable things that can reduce the accuracy of RSSI are environmental factors like humidity, interference from other wireless devices, multipath propagation phenomenon when, which occurs when radio signals bounce off surfaces and arrive at the receiver from multiple directions and signal attenuation, which is a weakening of the signal as it passes through objects or travels long distances. Now keep in mind that even though all of these factors can degrade the accuracy of the RSSI calculation, for most applications, RSSI's accuracy will be good enough. But let's say the assets you want to track are very small and therefore require a higher degree of accuracy in order to effectively locate or you're tracking assets that are used in emergency situations where you want to reduce the risk of low accuracy. It's in situations like this where RSSI may not be the right choice, or at least not on its own. Another major consideration is, of course, Bluetooth direction finding. RSSI will give you the approximate distance a transmitter is away from the receiver, but it will not tell you which direction it is away from the receiver. In other words, let's say you have a warehouse with one receiver in the center of each room and a transmitter attached to a high value asset. RSSI could tell you which room the asset is in, but it wouldn't be able to tell you where exactly in the room it is or even which direction it is relative to the receiver. Also consider an access control system where BLE is used to unlock the door as a person approaches it from the outside. In this case, RSSI would not be sufficient because it would only tell you if the person is near the door, not on which side of the door they are on. You would need direction information to successfully detect if a person is approaching the door from the outside. There are many other potential scenarios where a high level of accuracy, direction information, or both are required. It's in these scenarios where you'll want to consider using direction finding instead of, or maybe in conjunction with RSSI. So what is direction finding exactly? Direction finding is used to estimate the direction of a BLE signal from a transmitter to one or more receivers. Direction finding relies on the angle of arrival or angle of departure method to determine the signal's direction between the transmitting BLE device, such as a tag or beacon, and the receiving device. In the angle of arrival method, multiple antennas are placed at the receiver side, which is typically a fixed device like an access point or a gateway. These antennas capture special direction finding data called constant tone extension, or CTE, that is sent by the transmitter. The CTE is a continuous, unmodulated signal that is appended to a standard Bluetooth LE packet. This continuous tone is used to accurately measure the phase difference between the received signals, which is the critical data used to calculate the direction of the signal. In the angle of departure method, the transmitter has multiple antennas, while the receiver has a single antenna. The transmitter transmits the direction finding signals from different antennas in a known pattern or sequence. The receiver measures the time difference between the received signals to determine the angle of departure or AOD. Similar to an AOA, the CTE that is appended to the standard Bluetooth LE packet provides a clear continuous signal, which can be more precisely analyzed for phase differences or antenna sequencing. 
This then helps to improve the accuracy of the direction finding estimation. It's important to note that when only one receiver is used in a direction finding system, it works like a compass application where only the direction of the transmitter is calculated, but not its exact position. This is because a single antenna array is unable to provide accurate distance information about the asset or account for its potential movement in a two-dimensional plane. To accurately determine the position of the transmitter, two or more receivers with antenna arrays are needed. By using two or more locators equipped with antenna arrays, the transmitter's position can be pinpointed through a process known as triangulation. In this method, the asset's location is identified at the intersection of lines drawn in the directions determined by the direction finding algorithm. When multiple receivers are used, high precision timing synchronization must be used in to ensure accuracy. For even higher accuracy position estimation, it can be combined with RSSI measurements. Now, I've already mentioned that direction finding based location estimation provides greater accuracy than RSSI, but there are still several factors that can affect the accuracy of a direction finding system. Let's walk through each of them. Similar to RSSI, direction finding will be affected by environmental factors like multipath propagation and reflections. Additionally, the more interference from other wireless devices, the less accurate the location approximations will be. On the hardware configuration side, you're dealing with some added complexity. The placement of the antennas and configuration of the receivers can definitely affect the accuracy of the system. And on the back end, the complexity of the signal processing algorithms can also have an effect on its accuracy. Direction finding offers several advantages and disadvantages when compared to RSSI for BLE RTLS. One of the key benefits of direction finding is that it generally provides higher accuracy than RSSI based systems, particularly in environments with significant interference and physical obstacles. Additionally, direction finding can function well even in the absence of a clear line of sight between the transmitter and the receiver. Another key benefit of direction finding is that it can provide valuable direction data for locating devices, which is simply not possible to obtain with an RSSI based system, especially using a single locator device. In some situations, such as locating a single device within a specific area, direction finding could be less complex than RSSI, which often requires multiple receivers or anchors and complex algorithms to determine location. Lastly, direction finding may be less prone to false positives compared to RSSI based systems. Direction finding does have its limitations though. It generally requires more sophisticated and expensive hardware compared to RSSI based systems. Due to the need for antennas, direction finding systems can be more complex to calibrate and configure, often requiring additional expertise that wouldn't normally be needed to implement an RSSI based system. Another downside is that multiple receivers are required if you want to pinpoint a device's location and not just its direction. Lastly, one downside of direction finding is that it is not currently compatible with smartphones, although this could change as the technology becomes more widely adopted in the future. Now let's get to the demo portion of this video. I'm going to walk you through the setup of a real direction finding system and we'll start collecting some direction data together. Over here I have in terms of hardware, a direction finding antenna array board from Silicon Labs. Uh, this embeds the EFR BG22 radio chipset. And through a cable connects to what's called a pro kit. This is the main board that's used to interface with it um, from Simplicity Studio, which is the IDE that you have seen in front of you here on the computer. And this embeds also includes an LCD screen, so you can display some data on it if you wish to during uh, development, application development. So you connect this to the computer, and once you do that, you will be able to see the device show up in Simplicity Studio here in the launcher view. So there are a few requirements that you need to get set up before you can run this demo. So the first thing is the board will not show up as it's showing in front of you here. The first time that you set it up, uh, you have to do a little bit of configuration and there is documentation from Silicon Labs on how to do that. So I'll link to that in the description below. In terms of hardware, also you need another device, another board. Uh, I'm using the Thunderboard 
BG22 Thunderboard from Silicon Labs as well. And I have this flashed with a demo that basically acts as an asset tag. So this is the device that will be tracked in rel rel you know relative to the antenna board, antenna array board, and we'll be able to see that in the tool that's used within Simplicity Studio. So first thing you want to make sure that the radio board is connected to the Pro Kit. This is the main board, the main development board, and that is connected through a USB cable to your computer and that you have Simplicity Studio 5 or later. Once you do that and you set up and configure um, for it to recognize the, the board and the antenna array board as well, you can go to example projects and demos and then you do a search for AOA. This is also described in the documentation. And then you want to run the demo and not the example. So the difference between example projects and demos, examples usually are used as a starting point for development. So they set up a project within Simplicity Studio and you have to build, compile them, and then flash them to the device or the, the development board that you're using and they don't usually include the bootloader so you'll have to flash the bootloader first with a demo it's really much more it's much simpler it's seamless out of the box experience so you can just run the demo and it will run on the development kit and the development board without you having to do much outside of that so once you run that i have it already running on this board you'll also want to configure the asset tag. So once you connect a board that's compatible with that, you'll also do similar search for AOA and you'll look for Bluetooth AOA SOC asset tag, but the demo. So the Thunderboard BG22, I think is the only development board that has the demo uh, available for that. Otherwise you'll have to use the example and then run, compile it and build, build it and flash it to the device as well as the bootloader before that. So once you have that, so I have that ready flashed on this device. I don't have it connected to any power, so I'm going to be using a CR2032 battery to connect it and be able to run it that way. So the next thing you want to do is once you select the radio board that has the antenna board connected to it, you go to compatible tools and you find the AOA analyzer. Once you launch that, sometimes it says that connection has failed. Uh, it's probably trying to connect to something else. I like to maximize the view here and then make sure that you have dual polarized board selected. Once you have that selected, select the appropriate device, the corresponding device, and then hit connect. So once you're connected to that, you are presented with a few different options. You have uh, different configurations that you can set up here. We won't look at a lot of these. Um, the one that we want to look at is the AOX mode. So this applies to AOA and AOD. In that case, um, this gives you different options for how accurate, how fast the operation uh, that you want to run the demo in. So here you see I have the board. I can rotate it around with the mouse uh, by left clicking, holding down. Um, I can also zoom in and out by scrolling. And then finally, I'm going to be powering on the asset tag. So in order to do that, I'm just going to put in the, the battery. And as soon as I do that, you'll see that there is an arrow. And let's zoom out so we can see that. We can also rotate to kind of get a better view or a different view. Um, so in here, the one that's selected right now, the mode is in real time high accuracy. So this is a lot slower than the other modes, but it does give you more accurate and a smoother uh, detection of the direction of the asset tag. So I can move it around, point it, take it down and have the direction will be updated to point to the current location or the current position of the device. Now there are there is a different demo that you can run that's AOA. Uh, it's a positioning tool, but that requires uh, a couple, uh, at least two or more locator boards. So we won't be running through that in this case because I only have one at the moment. That will give you more position detection instead of just direction. 
Okay, so another useful tool here and view is the analyzer view. So I can go to that and then you'll see here there's different options. Um, we can take a look at, for example, let's go with azimuth in time on the left side. Once you select that, the values start to show up. Uh, let's select elevation in time and take a look at that. So we have the smooth, the real time. Um, so we have the real time high accuracy mode selected. So we are going to get slower responses, but more accurate values. So I can lower the device and we should start to see the elevation go down. The azimuth gets updated also when I move the asset tag around the board. We can also switch this to show in a much easier view here. So we can see on top of each other, I can do different tests and see the values get updated on the view. So that's really it in terms of the direction finding demo using the Silicon Labs antenna array board, the BG22 based radio board and using an asset tag also running on one of the Silicon Labs platform or development kits. And that's it for this video. You can find more BLE resources in the description box below. If you've enjoyed watching this video and found it helpful, be sure to like and subscribe and hit the notification bell to be notified when my next video comes out. And I'll see you guys in the next one.